So this this question was submitted by JQ, and I also f saw this question um, in one shape or form, this Q&A, submitted by this Q&A. And it has to do with ApoB and lipoproteins. So I, I, I've definitely covered <clears throat> this topic in, in, in detail in previous Q&As. I'd probably cover it once every year and a half or so or something like that. So the question has to do with ApoB and LDL cholesterol and those numbers being quite high, eating a fairly healthy diet or, you know, being, being relatively healthy, eating mostly low carb, exercising, being at a healthy weight, but still having high ApoB and LDL. And to be, basically, is there anything to address? And I think, first of all, understanding, look, ApoB is a protein that's produced in the liver. It provides structural support for lipoproteins, particularly VLDL, so that's the pre precursor to LDL. ApoB is a marker of cardiovascular health for a couple of reasons. First, it's a more direct way to measure LDL particle number, which may be more relevant for cardiovascular health than total LDL cholesterol. Second, ApoB is what is likely to insert into arterial walls, which then basically allow the LDL lipoprotein to not be recycled. They sort of start that cascade of inflammation and foam cell formation. So ApoB is relevant. And um, there's, there's a lot of interest in the regulation of ApoB. It's mostly regulated through degradation and not synthesis. So it's re regulated mostly in getting rid of it and not the production of it. Uh, your, con your, your liver is really constantly making ApoB uh, to some degree. And we do know that there is one factor that regulates the synthesis or production of it, and that is inflammation, and particularly cytokines like TNF-alpha and interferon. TNF-alpha can be dramatically increased, again, under like conditions of intestinal permeability. And I talked a lot about this in a presentation I gave a couple of months ago. And there, there are a variety of factors that can regulate intestinal permeability, stress, alcohol, diet, particularly um, a, a very, very high fat, refined carbohydrate diet, but even a high fat, low fiber diet in some, some cases can, can increase um, intestinal permeability. Interestingly, we know that omega-3, particularly the marine omega-3s, DHA and EPA, so fish oil supplementation has been shown to decrease ApoB levels in people with dyslipidemia and also in people with normal lipids. So um, the dose was about 1,500 milligrams of EPA and 1,000 milligrams of DHA. That was shown to decrease ApoB, possibly through this inflammation-related you know, related mechanism or maybe other mechanisms as well. We know that, that, that omega-3... Um, has been shown to reduce T TNF alpha, for example, and in fact, omega three has been shown to re reduce lipopolysaccharide uh, induced from a meal. And again, lipopolysaccharide, when lipopolysaccharide makes its way into circulation from the gut, it increases TNF alpha. I think there's a lot of potential um, synergistic effects going on there with omega three, where it's stopping the LPS release, and so that's one way it's reducing inflammatory markers like TNF alpha. And in, it's also just resolving the inflammation quicker and lowering the inflammation. So I think that the omega-3 um, is probably one sort of low-hanging fruit avenue to explore with respect to um, ApoB reduction. Fish has also been shown to lower a ApoB synthesis. So another study found that um, a, a even higher dose of of fish oil, so 1.8 grams of EPA and 1.2 grams of DHA was able to lower ApoB production by 29% in people with normal blood lipids. So um, that's pretty cool. There was also a decrease in the VLDL pool size by 43%. So that's the sort of supplemental side uh, of, the, of the story. And again, you guys already know, um, and you'll hear more about my supplementation routine in a minute, but you already know I'm a huge, huge fan of omega-3 supplementation. And I've also, I've also seen a variety of questions in, in, submitted in this Q&A about fish intake and concerns about heavy metals from fish intake and, uh, you know, if there's a trade-off or not. So I will say this. 
you know, yes, to some degree, you're going to get some contamination from from fish. And, you know, the best thing you could do is go for the fish that are known to be lower in heavy metals and contaminants, right? So those are the wild Alaskan salmon, sardines. You got to find, obviously, um, there, there could be some uh, contamination with arsenic with some of the sardines. But finding the smaller fish that are not accumulating these heavy metals as much. But also keep in mind that there have been studies done, um, particularly in pregnant women, where pregnant women eating fish, in fact, the biomarker for fish intake was mercury. So they knew the women were eating more fish because their mercury levels were much higher than women that were not. And the omega-3 fatty acid content in the fish protected the developing fetus and not only protected the developing fetus, there was benefits from it. In other words, not getting the fish, even though there was lower mercury, was worse for the fetus, that is, which is more sensitive, by the way, to heavy metals than, than an adult is. So, the, so they were more sensitive. So they're more sensitive to the heavy, heavy metals. And yet having the higher heavy metals was better because of the omega-3. So it's like the omega-3 is negating some of these potential adverse effects from, from these heavy metals. Not to mention, again, you know, excreting some of these heavy metals through sweat and also through things like beta mercaptans from garlic, um, which helps excrete it through urine, also helps. So... You know, I personally choose to eat fish, but if you're super, super concerned about heavy metals and you get your heavy metals measured, um, you know, that that that's something to keep in mind is also having your omega-3 index measured and how high is your omega-3 index because that should really tell you something, not to mention the fact that, you know, you can also obviously supplement with a higher dose of omega-3 and maybe cut down some of your fish intake if that's also... Um, a, a really big concern for me. I, I I personally like to eat the fish in addition. There's other micronutrients that are also present in the fish that are beneficial as well. So um, I think that uh, that's kind of my take on that. And that was a big tangent. I'm going to get back to the ApoE here. I mean, to the ApoB story here, because there's also a story to be told with respect to diet. And I know that a lot of people follow a low carb diet. And uh, JQ had mentioned it in in, in his initial question. And there's been some really interesting research, a lot of it from my friend and former colleague, Dr. Ron, Ron Krauss, who's done a lot of work on this, um, looking at how different types of diets, low carb versus low fat, and how they affect ApoB and how they affect other risk factors like small dense LDL, for example. And it's interesting because it, it really, the dietary effects on ApoB and small dense LDL really come down to where a person is at their baseline in terms of their their phenotype. So um, there's, a, there's a big genetic predisposition to whether or not a person is a phenotype A versus a phenotype B. And in, in other words, whether or not they're making more of the small, dense LDL uh, product products versus not. And and so starting out on, you know, someone that's already genetically predisposed to making a lot of small, dense LDL um, is something that's important to consider when, when making dietary changes. So for example, looking at a high fat versus a low fat diet and then switching, you know, doing a, doing a, a switch over. So, so men that did either a high fat or low fat and then they switch the diet after doing the diet. Um, after the high fat diet, the individual individuals were classified as either phenotype A or phenotype B. And then if they were following a low fat diet, all the phenotype B individuals stayed phenotype B. But about 36 of those people shifted from a phenotype A to a phenotype B, whereas about half, like 51 of this, of the people remained phenotype A. After the low-fat diet, phenotype B subjects had a greater decrease in their their um, total cholesterol, and also they decreased their ApoB. Um, whereas phenotype A, um, 
compared to phenotype A. Whereas phenotype A, people had reductions in their, their total cholesterol, but they also had no change in their ApoB. So it seems as though a low-fat diet may be more beneficial for people that already are phenotype B, already are people that are genetically predisposed to making small, dense LDL. So phenotype B people are you know, predisposed to, to um, higher small, dense LDL, higher ApoB than phenotype A. So a low-fat diet may not necessarily benefit people that are phenotype A, that already sort of are not genetically predisposed to that but it may benefit some of the people that are phenotype B. Um, and that would be something to sort of explore through some self-experimentation. There's another study that showed people, again, that are phenotype B that are put on a high saturated fat diet had a significant increase in ApoB and also a significant increase in small and small and also total LDL particles. So uh, again, it might, this might mean that people that have a phenotype B type of lipid profile might not do well on a very high, low carb, high fat diet. And that is, I, I also think this is also something where looking at the conflicting data, this is, there, there, there's a genetic component in there. And um, I think that that's not usually considered. But if a phenotype is measured at the baseline, is this person phenotype A or phenotype B, then you can kind of maybe say, well, maybe I'm phenotype B. Maybe I should not be doing so much of a high-fat, low-carb diet. Maybe I should be eating more fiber and eating more mono and polyunsaturated fats and, and less of the high-saturated fat. And this was also asked by Bernardo, who, who asked if, if there was any recommendations for a low-carb diet with the problem, again, of elevating ApoB due to the consumption of high quantities of fat. And, and he was talking about doing keto for years and his LDL going just through the roof and his ApoB um, also going really high. So again, I would say many low carb or keto eaters do eat a lot of saturated fat. And some of these people that are already ApoB to start with might consider doing a low saturated diet sort of fat, like a low saturated fat diet, um, and to see how that affects lipids. So low dairy, low cheese, low butter, low red meat, low coconut oil, low palm oil, like basically very low, or if, if any of those, replace those things with avocado oil, with olive oil, with avocados and oils and nuts and uh, fat from like salmon, you know, and if you really, really, really want to do the keto version of it, again, like you can do a keto diet but instead of doing all the saturated fat, you do mono and polyunsaturated fat. And that would be something to, to really check because there are, again, people that are already phenotype B that can increase their ApoB and do worse with a low-carb, high-fat diet, particularly, particularly when it's low-carb, high-saturated fat. 